Chapter 1 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Outscheller. Chapter 1. A boy and a man sat in a room of a stone house in the ancient city of Mexico, capital in turn of Aztec, Spaniard, and Mexican. They could see through the narrow windows, masses of low buildings and tile roofs, and beyond, the swelling shape of great mountains standing clear against the blue sky. But they had looked upon them so often that the mind took no note of the luminous spectacle. The cry of a water cellar or the occasional jingle of a spur came from the street below, but these too were familiar sounds, and they were no longer regarded. The room contained but little furniture, and the door was of heavy oak. Its whole aspect indicated that it was a prison. The man was of middle years, and his face showed a singular blend of kindness and firmness. The pallor of imprisonment had replaced his usual color. The boy was tall and strong, and his cheeks were yet ruddy. His features bore some resemblance to those of his older comrade. Ned, said the man at last, it's been good of you to stay with me here, but a prison is no place for a boy. You must secure a release and go back to our people. The boy smiled, and his face, in repose rather stern for one so young, was illumined in a wonderful manner. "'I don't want to leave you, Uncle Steve,' he said. "'And if I did, it's not likely that I could. This house is strong, and it's a long way from here to Texas.' "'Perhaps I can induce them to let you go,' said the man. "'Why should they wish to hold one so young?' Edward Fulton did not reply, because he saw that Stephen Austin was speaking to himself rather than his companion. Instead, he looked once more through the window and over the city at the vast white peaks of Popocatapetl and Itaxahuatl, silent and immutable, forever guarding the skyline. Yet they seemed to call him at this moment and tell him of freedom. The words of the man had touched a spring within him, and he wanted to go. He could not conceal from himself the fact that he longed for liberty with every pulse and fiber. But he resolved, nevertheless, to stay. He would not desert the one who he had come to serve. Stephen Austin, the real founder of Texas, had now been in prison in Mexico more than a year. Coming to Saltillo to secure for the Texans better treatment from the Mexicans, their rulers, he had been seized and held as a criminal. The boy, Edward Fulton, was not really his nephew, but an orphan, the son of a cousin. He owed much to Austin, and coming to the capital to help him, he was sharing his imprisonment. They say that Santa Anna now has the power, said Ned, breaking the somber silence. It's true, said Stephen Austin. It is a new and strong reason why I fear for our people. Of all the cunning and ambitious men in Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna is the most cunning and ambitious. I know, too, that he is the most able, and I believe that he is the most dangerous of those to us who have settled in Texas. What a country is this, Mexico! Revolution after revolution! You make a treaty with one president today, and tomorrow another disclaims it. More than one of them has a touch of genius, and yet it is obscured by childishness and cruelty. He sighed heavily. Ned, full of sympathy, glanced at him but said nothing. Then his gaze turned back to the mighty peaks, which stood so sharp and clear against the blue. Truth and honesty were the most marked qualities of Stephen Austin, and he could not understand the vast web of intrigue in which the Mexican capital was continually involved. And to the young mind of the boy, cast in the same mold, it was yet more baffling and repellent. Ned still stared at the guardian peaks, but his thoughts floated away from them. His head had been full of old romance when he entered the Vale of Tenochtitlan. He had almost seen Cortez and his conquistadors in their visible forms with their armor clanking about them as they stalked before him. He had eagerly gazed upon the lakes, the mighty mountains, the low houses, and the strange people. Here, deeds of which the world still talked, had been done centuries ago, and his thrill was strong and long. But the feeling was gone now. He had liked many of the Mexicans and many of the Mexican traits, but he had felt with increasing force that he could never reach out his hand and touch anything solid. He thought of volcanic beings on a volcanic soil. The throb of a drum came from the street below, and presently the shrill sound of fifes was mingled with the steady beat. Ned stood up and pressed his head as far forward as the bars of the windows would let him. Soldiers, a regiment, I think, he said. Ah, I can see them now. What brilliant uniforms their officers wear. Austin also looked out. Yes, he said. They know how to dress for effect, and their music is good, too. Listen how they play. 
It was a martial air, given with a splendid lilt and swing. The tune crept into Ned's blood, and his hand beat time on the stone sill. But the music increased his longing for liberty. His thoughts passed away from the narrow street and the marching regiment to the north, to the wild free plains beyond the Rio Grande. It was there his heart was, and it was there that his body would be. It is General Koss who leads them, said Austin. I can see him now, riding upon a white horse. It is the man in the white and silver uniform, Ned. He is the brother-in-law of Santa Anna, is he not? Yes, and I fear him. I know well, Ned, that he hates the Texans, all of us. Perhaps the regiment that we see now is going north against our people. Austin's brows contracted. It may be so, he said. But they give us soft words all the time, and yet they hold me a prisoner here. It would be like them to strike while pretending to clear away all the troubles between us. He sighed again. Ned watched the soldiers until the last of them had passed the window. And he listened to the music, the sound of drum and fife, until it died away. And they heard only the usual murmur of the city. Then the homesickness, the longing for the great free country to the north, grew upon him and became almost overpowering. Someone comes, said Austin. They heard the sound of the heavy bar that closed the door being moved from its place. Our dinner, doubtless, said Austin, but it's early. The door swung wide and a young Mexican officer entered. He was taller and fairer than most of his race, evidently of pure northern Spanish blood, and his countenance was frank and fine. Welcome, Lieutenant, said Stephen Austin, speaking in Spanish which he, as well as Ned, understood perfectly. You know that we are always glad to see you here. Lieutenant Alfonso de Zavala smiled in a quick, responsive way, but in a moment his face became grave. I announce a visitor, a most distinguished visitor, Mr. Austin, he said. General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, President of the Mexican Republic and Commander-in-Chief of its armies and navies. Both Mr. Austin and the boy arose and bowed as a small man of middle years, slender and nervous, strode into the room, standing for a few moments near its center and looking about him like a questing hawk. His was, in truth, an extraordinary presence. He seemed to radiate an influence that at once attracted and repelled. His dark features were cut sharply and clearly. His eyes, set close together, were of the most intense black that Ned had ever seen in a human head. Nor were those eyes ever at rest. They roamed over everything, and they seemed to burn every object for the single instant they fell there. They never met the gaze of either American squarely, although they continually came back to both. This man was clothed in a white uniform, heavy with gold stripes and gold epaulets. A small sword at his side had a gold hilt set with a diamond. He wore a three-cornered hat shaped like that of Napoleon, but instead of the Corsican simple gray, his was bright in color and splendid with plumage. He was at once a powerful and sinister figure. Ned felt that he was in the presence of genius, but it belonged to one of those sinuous creatures, shining and terrible, that are bred under the vivid sun of the tropics. There was a singular sensation at the roots of his hair, but, resolved to show neither fear nor apprehensions, he stood and gazed directly at Santa Anna. "'Be seated, Mr. Austin,' said the general, "'and close the door, de Zavala, but remain with us. Your young relative can remain also. I have things of importance to say.' but it is not forbidden to him also to hear them. Ned sat down, and so did Mr. Austin and young de Zavala, but Santa Anna remained standing. It seemed to Ned that he did so because he wished to look down upon them from a height, and all the time the black eyes, like two burning coals, played restlessly around the room. Ned was unable to take his own eyes away. The figure in its gorgeous uniform was so full of nervous energy that it attracted like a magnet while at the same time it bade all who opposed to beware. The boy felt as if he were before a splendid leopard with no bars of a cage between. Santa Anna took three or four rapid steps back and forth. He kept his hat upon his head, a right, it seemed, due to his superiority to other people. He looked like a man who had a great thought which he was shaping into quick words. Presently he stopped before Austin and shot him one of those piercing glances. My friend and guest, he said in sonorous Spanish. Austin bowed. Whether the subtle Mexican meant the words in satire or in earnest, he did not know, nor did he care greatly. When I call you my friend and guest, I speak truth, said Santa Anna. It is true that we brought you here from Saltillo, and we insist that you accept our continued hospitality. But it is because we know how devoted you are to our common Mexico, and we would have you here at our right hand for advice and help. 
Ned saw Mr. Austin smile a little sadly. It all seemed very strange to the boy. How could one talk of friendship and hospitality to those whom he held as prisoners? Why could not these people say what they meant? Again he longed for the free winds of the plains. You and I together should be able to quiet these troublesome Texans, continued Santa Anna, and his voice became a hard metallic quality that rasped the boy's nerves. You know, Stephen Austin, that I in Mexico have endured much from the people whom you have brought within our borders. They shed good Mexican blood at the Fort Velasco, and they have attacked us elsewhere. They do not pay their taxes or obey our decrees, and when I send my officers to make them obey, they take down their long rifles. Austin smiled again, and now the watching boy thought the smile was not sad at all. If Santa Anna took notice, he gave no sign. But you are reasonable, continued the Mexican, and now his manner was winning to an extraordinary degree. It was my predecessor, Farias, who brought you here, but I would not see you go because I love you like a brother, and now I have come to you that between us we may calm your turbulent Texans. But you must bear in mind, said Austin, that our rights have been taken from us. All the clauses of our charter have been broken. And now your Congress has decreed that we shall have only one soldier to every five hundred inhabitants, and that all the rest of us shall be disarmed. How are we, in a wild country, to protect ourselves from the Comanches, Lipans, and other Indians who roam everywhere, robbing and murdering? Austin's face, usually so benevolent, flushed and his eyes were very bright. Ned looked intently at Santa Anna to see how he would take the daring and truthful indictment. But the Mexican showed no confusion, only astonishment. He threw up his hands in a vivid southern gesture and looked at Austin in surprised reproof. My friend, he said in injured but not angry tones, how can you ask me such a question? Am I not here to protect the Texans? Am I not president of Mexico? Am I not head of the Mexican army? My gallant soldiers, my horsemen with their lances and sabers, will draw a ring around the Texans through which no Comanche or Lipan, however daring, will be able to break. He spoke with such fire, such appearance of earnestness that Ned, despite a mind uncommonly keen and analytical in one so young, was forced to believe for a moment. Texas, however, was far and immense, and there were not enough soldiers in all America to put a ring around the wild Comanches. But the impression remained longer with Austin, who was ever hoping for the best and ever seeing the best in others. Ned was a silent boy who had suffered many hardships, and he had acquired the habit of thought in which its turn brought observation and judgment. Yet if Santa Anna was acting... He was doing it with consummate skill, and the boy, who never said a word, watched him all the time. Santa Anna began to talk now of the great future that awaited the Texans under the banner of Mexico. He poured forth the words in so much Latin fervor that it was almost like listening to a song. Ned felt the influence of the musical roll coming over him again, but with an effort of the will that was almost physical, he shook it off. Santa Anna painted the picture of a dream, a gorgeous dream of many colors. Mexico was to become a mighty country, and the Texans, with their cool courage and martial energy, would be no mean factor in it. Austin would be one of his lieutenants, a sharer in his greatness and reward. His eloquence was wonderful, and Ned felt once more the fascination of the serpent. This was a man to whom only the grand and magnificent appealed, and already he had achieved a part of his dream. Ned moved a little closer to the window. He wished the fresh air to blow upon his face. He saw that Mr. Austin was fully under the spell. Santa Anna was making the most beautiful and convincing promises. He himself was going to Texas. He was the father of his people. He would right every wrong. He loved the Texans, these children of the North, who had come to his country for a home. No one could ever say that he appealed in vain to Santa Anna for protection. Texans would be proud that they were part of Mexico and they would be glad to belong to a nation which already had a glorious history, and to come to a capital which had more splendor and romance than any other in America. Ned literally withdrew his soul within itself. He sought to shut out the influence that was radiating from this singular and brilliant figure, but he saw that Mr. Austin was falling more deeply under it. Look, said Santa Anna, taking the man by the arm in the familiar manner that one old friend has with another and drawing him to the window. Is it not this a prospect to enchant? Is not this capital of which you and I can well be proud? He lifted a forefinger and swept a half curve that could be seen from the window. It was truly a panorama that would kindle the heart of the dullest. 
Forty miles away, the white crests of Papakatel and Ixtahuatl still showed against the background of a burning blue, like pillars supported the dome of heaven. Along the whole line of the half-curve were mountains in fold on fold. Below the green of the valley showed the waters of the lake, both fresh and salt, gleaming with gold, where the sunlight shot down upon them. Nearer rose the spires of the cathedral, and then the sea of tile roofs burnished by the vivid beams. Santa Anna stood in a dramatic position, his finger still pointing. There was scarcely a day that Ned did not feel the majesty of this valley of Tenochtitlan. But Santa Anna deepened the spell. Could the world hold another place its equal? Might not the Texans indeed have a glorious future in the land of which this city was the capital? Poetry and romance appealed powerfully to the boy's thoughtful mind, and he felt that here in Mexico he was at their very heart. Nothing else had ever moved him so much. You are pleased. It impresses you, said Santa Anna to Austin. I can see it on your face. You are with us. You are one of us. Ah, my friend, how noble it is to have a great heart. Do I go with your message to the Texans? asked Austin. I must leave now, but I shall come again soon, and I will tell you all. You shall carry words that will satisfy every one of them. He threw his arms about Austin's shoulders, gave Ned a quick salute, and then left the room, taking young de Zavala with him. Ned heard the heavy bar fall in place on the outside of the door, and he knew that they were shut in as tightly as ever. But Mr. Austin was in a glow. "'What a wonderful, flexible mind,' he said more to himself than to the boy. "'I could have preferred a sort of independence for Texas, but since we're to be ruled from the city of Mexico, Santa Ana will do the best he can for us. As soon as he sweeps away the revolutionary troubles, he will repair all our injuries.' Ned was silent. He knew that the generous Austin was still under Santa Anna's magnetic spell. But, after his departure, the whole room was changed to the boy. He saw clearly again. There were no mists or clouds about his mind. Moreover, the wonderful half-curve before the window was changing. Vapors were rolling up from the south, and the two great peaks faded from view. Trees and water in the valley changed to gray. The skies, which had been so bright now, became somber and menacing. The boy felt a deep fear at his heart, but Mr. Austin seemed to be yet under the influence of Santa Anna, and talked cheerfully of their speedy return to Texas. Ned listened in silence and unbelief, while the gloom outside deepened, and night presently came over Anahuac. But he had formed his resolution. He owed much to Mr. Austin. He had come a vast distance to be at his side and to serve him in prison, but he felt now that he could be of more use elsewhere. Moreover, he must carry a message, a warning to those who needed it solely. One of the windows opened upon the north, and he looked intently through it, trying to pierce, with the mind's eye at least, the thousand miles that lay between him and those whom he would reach with the word. Mr. Austin had lighted a candle. Noticing the boy's gloomy face, he patted him on the head with a benignant hand and said, Don't be down of heart, Edward, my lad. We'll soon be on our way to Texas. But this is Mexico, and it is Santa Ana who holds us. That is true, and it is Santa Anna who is our best friend. Ned did not dispute the sanguine saying. He saw that Mr. Austin had his opinion, and he had his. The door was opened again in a half hour, and a soldier brought them their supper. Young de Zavala, who was their immediate guardian, also entered and stood by while they ate. They had never received poor food, and tonight Mexican hospitality exerted itself, at the insistence of Santa Anna, Ned surmised. In addition to the regular supper, there was an ice and a bottle of Spanish wine. The president had just given an order that the greatest courtesy be shown to you at all times, said de Zavala, and I am very glad. I, too, have people in that territory of ours from which you come, Texas. He spoke with undeniable sympathy, and Ned felt his heart warm towards him. But he decided to say nothing. He feared that he might betray by some chance word the plan he had in mind. But Mr. Austin, believing in others because he was so truthful and honest himself, talked freely. "'All our troubles will soon be over,' he said to de Zavala. "'I hope so, senor,' said the young man earnestly. By and by, when de Zavala and the soldier were gone, Ned went again to the window, stood there a few moments to harden his resolution, and then came back to the man. "'Mr. Austin,' he said, "'I'm going to ask your consent to something.' The Texan looked up in surprise. "'Why, Edward, my lad,' he said kindly, "'you don't have to ask my consent for anything, "'after the way in which you have already sacrificed yourself for me. "'But I'm not going to stay with you any longer, Mr. Austin. "'That is, if I can help it. "'I'm going back to Texas.' 
Mr. Austin laughed. It was a mellow and satisfied laugh. So you are, Edward, he said, and I am going with you. You will help me to bear a message of peace and safety to the Texans. Ned paused a moment, irresolute. There was no change in his determination. He was merely uncertain about the words to use. There may be delays, he said at last, and, Mr. Austin, I have decided to go alone, and within the next day or two if I can. The Texan's face clouded. I cannot understand you, he said. Why this hurry? It would, in reality, be a breach of faith to our great friend Santa Anna, that is, if you could go. I don't believe you can. Ned was troubled. He was tempted to tell what was in his mind, but he knew that he would not be believed. So he fell back again upon his infinite capacity for silence. Mr. Austin read resolution in the closed lips and rigid figure. Do you really mean that you will attempt to steal away? he asked. As soon as I can. The man shook his head. It would be better not to do so, he said. But you are your own master, and I see I cannot dissuade you from the attempt. But, boy, you will promise me not to take any unnecessary or foolish risks. I promise gladly, and Mr. Austin, I hate to leave you here. Their quarters were commodious, and Ned slept alone in a small room to the left of the main apartment. It was a bare place with only a bed and a chair, but it was lighted by a fairly large window. Ned examined this window critically. It had a horizontal iron bar across the middle, and it was about thirty feet from the ground. He pulled at the iron bar with both hands, but, although rusty with time, it would not move in its socket. Then he measured the two spaces between the bar and the wall. Hope sprang up in the boy's heart. Then he did a strange thing. He removed nearly all his clothing and tried to press his head and shoulders between the bar and the wall. His head, which was of the long, narrow type, so common in the scholar, would have gone through the aperture had it not been for his hair, which was long and grew uncommonly thick. His shoulders were very thick and broad as they, too, halted him. He drew back and felt a keen thrill of disappointment. But he was a boy who usually clung tenaciously to an idea, and, sitting down, he concentrated his mind upon the plan that he had formed. By and by, a possible way out came to him. Then he lay down upon the bed, drew a blanket over him because the night was chill in the city of Mexico, and calmly sought sleep. End of chapter one. Reading by Mr. Duck. Chapter Two of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck. The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Two. The optimism of Mr. Austin endured the next morning, but Ned was gloomy. Since it was his habit to be silent, the man did not notice it at first. The breakfast was good, with tortillas, frijoles, and other Mexican dishes, and coffee, but the boy had no appetite. He merely picked at his food, made a faint effort or two to drink his coffee, and finally put the cup back, almost full, in the saucer. Then Mr. Austin began to observe. "'Are you ill, Ned?' he asked. "'Is this imprisonment beginning to tell upon you? I thought that you were standing it well. Can't you eat?' "'I don't believe I'm hungry,' replied the boy. "'But there is nothing else the matter with me. I'll be all right, Uncle Steve. Don't you bother about me.' He ate a little breakfast, about one half the usual amount, and then, asking to be excused, went to the window, where he again stared out at the tiled roofs, the green foliage in the Valley of Mexico, and the ranges and peaks beyond. He was taking his resolution, and he was carrying it out, but it was hard, very hard. He foresaw that he would have to strengthen his will many, many times. Mr. Austin took no further worry on Ned's account, thinking that he would be all right again in a day or two. But at the dinner which was brought to them in the middle of the day, Ned showed a marked failure of appetite, and Mr. Austin felt real concern. The boy, however, was sure that he would be all right before the day was over. "'It must be a lack of fresh air and exercise,' said Mr. Austin. "'You can really take exercise in here, Ned. Besides, you said that you were going to escape. If you fall ill, you will have no chance at all.' He spoke half in jest, but Ned took him seriously. I'm not ill, Uncle Steve, he said. I really feel very well, but I've lost my appetite. Maybe I'm getting tired of these Mexican dishes. Take exercise! Take exercise! said Mr. Austin with emphasis. I think I will, said Ned. Physical exercise, after all, fitted in with his ideas, and that afternoon he worked hard at all the gymnastic feats possible within the three rooms to which they were confined. De Zavala came in and expressed his astonishment at the athletic feats, which Ned continued with unabated zeal despite his presence. Why do you do these things, he asked in wonder, to keep myself strong and healthy? 
I ought to have begun them sooner. This Mexican air is depressing, and I find that I am losing my appetite. Dizavala's eyes opened wide while Ned deftly turned a handspring. Then the young American sat down panting. His face flushed as with as healthy a color as anyone could find anywhere. You'll have an appetite tonight, said Mr. Austin. But to his great amazement, Ned again played with his food, eating only half the usual amount. You're surely ill, said Mr. Austin. I've no doubt that Zavala will allow us to have a physician, and I shall ask him for one. Don't do it, Uncle Steve, begged Ned. There's nothing at all the matter with me, and anyhow I wouldn't want a Mexican doctor fussing over me. I've probably been eating too much. Mr. Austin was forced to accede. The boy certainly did not look ill, and his appetite was bound to become normal again in the next few days. But it did not. As far as Mr. Austin could measure it, Ned was eating less and less. It was obvious that he was thinner. He was also growing much paler, except for a red flush on the cheekbones. Mr. Austin became alarmed, but Ned obstinately refused any help, always asserting with emphasis that he had no ailment of any kind. But the man could see that he had become much lighter, and he wondered at the boy's physical failure. Dizavala, also, expressed his sorrow in sonorous Spanish, but Ned, while thanking them, steadily disclaimed any need of sympathy. The boy found the days hard, but the nights were harder. For the first time in his life, he could not sleep well. He would lie for hours so wide awake that his eyes grew used to the dark, and he could see everything in his room. He was troubled, too, by bad dreams, and in many of these dreams he was a living skeleton, wandering about and condemned to live forever without food. More than once he bitterly regretted the resolution he had taken, but having taken it, he would never alter it. His silent, concentrated nature would not let him. Yet he endured undoubted torture day by day. Torture was the only name for it. I shall send an application to President Santa Anna to have you allowed a measure of liberty, said Mr. Austin finally. You are simply pining away here, Edward, my lad. You cannot eat, that is, you eat only a little. I have passed the most tempting and delicate things to you, and you always refuse. No boy of your age would do so unless something were very much wrong with his physical system. You have lost many pounds, and if this keeps on, I do not know what will happen to you. I shall not ask for our liberty for you, but you must have a doctor at once. I do not want any doctor, Uncle Steve, said the boy. He cannot do me any good. But there is somebody else whom I want. Who is he? A barber. A barber? Now what good can a barber do you? A great deal. What I crave most in the world is a haircut, and only a barber can do that for me. My hair has been growing for more than three months, Uncle Steve, and you've seen how extremely thick it is. Now it is so long, too, that it's falling all about my eyes. Its weight is oppressing my brain. I feel a little touch of fever now and then, and I believe it is this awful hair. He ran his fingers through the heavy locks until his head seemed to be surrounded with the defense like the quills of a porcupine. Beneath the great bush of hair, his gray eyes glowed in a pale, thin face. There is a lot of it, said Mr. Austin, surveying him critically, but it is not usual for anybody in our situation to be worrying about the length and abundance of his hair. I'm sure I'd be a lot better if I could get it cut close. Well, well, if you're taking it so much to heart, we'll see what can be done. You are ill and wasted, Edward, and when one is in that condition, a little thing can affect his spirits. Dizavala is a friendly sort of young fellow, and through him we will send a request to Colonel Sandoval, the commander of the prisons, that you be allowed to have your hair cut. If you please, Uncle Steve, said Nate gratefully. Mr. Austin was not wrong in his forecast about Lieutenant de Zavala. He showed a full measure of sympathy, hence a petition to Colonel Martin Santoval y Dominguez, commander of prisons in the city of Mexico, was drawn up in due form. It stated that one Edward Fulton, a Texan of tender years, now in detention at the capital, was suffering from the excessive growth of hair upon his head. The weight and thickness of said hair had heated his brain and destroyed his appetite. In ordinary cases of physical decline, a physician was needed most, but so far as young Edward Fulton was concerned, a barber could render the greatest service. He had been descending, it seemed to him, fully an hour, and he must have come down a mile when he heard the rattle of a saber. It was so distinct and so near that it could not be imagination. He looked in the direction of the sound and saw two dark figures in the street. As he stared, the two figures shaped themselves into two Mexican officers. Truth, not fancy, told him that they were not moving. They had seen him escaping, and they would come for him. He pressed his body hard against the stone wall, and with his hands resting upon one of the knots, clung desperately to the rope. He was hanging in an alley, and the street at the mouth of it, six or seven yards away. They were talking, and it must be about him. He saw them create a light in some manner, and his hands almost slipped from the rope. Then joy flooded back. They were merely lighting cigarettes, and with a few more words to each other, they walked on. Ned slid slowly down, but when he came to the last knot, his strength gave way and he fell. It seemed to him that he was plunging an immeasurable distance through depths of space. 
Then he struck, and with the force of the blow, consciousness left him. When he revived, he found himself lying upon a rough stone pavement, and it was still dark. He saw above a narrow cleft of somber sky, and something cold and trailing lay across his face. He shivered with repulsion, snatched at it to throw it off, and found that it was his rope. Then he felt himself cautiously and fearfully, but found that no bones were broken, nor was he bruised to any degree, and now he knew that he could not have fallen more than two or three feet. Perhaps he had struck first upon the little pack which had fastened upon his back. It reminded him that he was shoeless and coatless, and undoing the pack, he reclothed himself fully. He was quite sure that he had not lain there more than a quarter of an hour. Nothing had happened while he was unconscious. It was a dark little alley in the rear of the prison, and the buildings on the other side that abutted it were windowless. He walked cautiously to the mouth of the alley and looked up and down the street. He saw no one, and pulling his cap down over his eyes, he started instinctively towards the north, because it was to the far north that he wished to go. He was fully aware that he faced great dangers, almost impossibilities. Practically nothing was in his favor, save that he spoke excellent Spanish and also Mexican versions of it. He went for several hundred yards along the rough and narrow street, and he began to shiver again. Now it was from cold, which often grows intense at night in the great valley of Mexico. Nor was it his wasted frame fitted to withstand it. He was assailed also by a fierce hunger. He had carried self-denial to the utmost limit, and nature was crying out against him in a voice that must be heard. He resolved to risk all and obtain food. Another hundred yards, and he saw crouched in an angle of the street an old woman who offered tortillas and frijoles for sale. He went a little nearer, but apprehension almost overcame him. It might be difficult for him to pass for a Mexican, and she would give the alarm. But he went yet nearer and stood where he could see her face. It was broad, fat, and dark, more Aztec than Spaniard, and then he approached boldly, his speed increased by the appetizing aroma arising from some flat cakes that lay over burning charcoal. I will take these, my mother, he said in Mexican, and leaning over, he snatched up half a dozen gloriously hot tortillas and frijoles. A cry of indignation and anger was checked at the old woman's lips as the two small silver coins slipped from the boy's hand and tinkled pleasantly together in her own. Holding his spoils in his hands, Ned walked swiftly up the street. He glanced back once and saw that the old Aztec woman had sunk back into her original position. He had nothing to fear from any alarm by her, and he looked ahead for some especially dark nook in which he could devour the precious food. He saw none, and he caught a glimpse beyond a foliage, and recalled enough of the city of Mexico to know what it was. It was the Zocalo, or Garden of the Cathedral, the Holy Metropolitan Church of Mexico. Above the foliage he could see the dark walls, and above them he saw the dome as he had seen it from the window of his prison. Over the dome itself rose a beautiful lantern, in which a light was now burning. Ned entered the garden, which contained many trees, and sat down in the thickest group of them. He began to eat. He was ravenous as any wolf, but he had been cultivating the power of will, and he ate like a gentleman, knowing that to do otherwise would not be good for him, but, tempered by discretion, it was a glorious pursuit. It was almost worth the long period of fasting and suffering for common Mexican food, bought on the street from an old Aztec woman to taste so well. Strength flowed back into every vein and muscle. He would not give way to fears and tremblings which were of the body rather than of the mind. He stopped when half of the food was gone, put the remainder in his pocket, and stood up. Fine drops of water struck him in the face. It had begun to rain, and a raw wind was moaning in the valley. Despite the warm food and the returning strength, Ned felt the desperate need of shelter. It was growing colder, too. Even as he stood there, the fine rain turned into fine snow. It melted as it fell but when it struck him about the neck and face it had an uncommonly penetrating power, and the chill seemed to go to the bone. He must have shelter. He looked at the dark walls of the cathedral, and then at the light in the slender lantern far above the dome. What more truly a shelter than a church? It had been sanctuary in the dark ages, and he must use it now as such. He left the trees and stood for a little while by a stone, one of the 124 which formerly enclosed an atrium. Still seeing nothing and hearing nothing but the whistle of the wind which drove the cold drops of snow under his collar, he advanced boldly again, sprang over the iron railing, and came to the walls of the old church where he stood a moment. Ned knew that in great Catholic cathedrals, like the one of Mexico, there were always side doors or little wickets used by priests or other high officials of the church, and he was hoping to find one that he could open. He passed halfway around the building, feeling cautiously along the cold stone. Once he saw a watchman with a sombrero, heavy cloak, and lantern. He pressed into a niche, and the watchman went on his automatic way, little thinking that anyone was near. 
The boy continued his circuit, and presently he found a wooden door, which he could not force. A little further he came to a second, which opened into his pressure. It was so small an entrance that he stooped as he passed in. He shut it carefully behind him, and stood in what was almost total darkness, until his eyes grew used to the gloom. Then he saw that he was in a vast interior, Doric in architecture, severe and simple. It was in the form of a Latin cross, with fluted columns dividing the aisles from the nave. Above him rose a noble dome. He could make out nothing more for the present. It was very still, very imposing, and at another time he would have been awed. But now he had found sanctuary. The cold and the snow were shut out, and a grateful warmth took their place. He walked down one of the aisles, careful that his footsteps should make no sound. He saw that there were rows of chapels, seven on either side of the church. It occurred to him that he would be safer in one of these rooms, and he chose that which seemed to be used the least. While on this search, he passed the main altar in the center of the building. He noticed that above the stalls a picture of the Virgin. He was a Protestant, but when he saw it, he crossed himself devoutly. Was not her church giving him shelter and refuge from his enemies? He also passed the altar of the kings, beneath which now lies the heads of the great Mexicans who secured the independence of their country from Spain. He looked a little at these before he entered the chapel of his choice. It was a small room, lighted scarcely at all by a narrow window, and it contained a few straight wooden pews, one of which had been turned about, facing the wall. He lay down in his pew, and even in daylight he would have been hidden from anyone a yard away. The hard wood was soft to him. He put his cap under his head and stretched himself out. Then, without will, he relaxed completely. Nature could stand no more. His eyes closed, and he floated off into the far and happy region of sleep. End of chapter 2 Reading by Mr. Duck Chapter 3 of The Texan Star This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mr. Duck The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller Chapter 3 Ned Fulton's sleep was that of exhaustion, and had lasted long. Although fine snow yet fell outside, and the raw wind blew it about, a pleasant warmth pervaded the snug alcove, made by the back of the pew in which he lay. He had been fortunate indeed to find such a place, because the body of the church was gloomy and cold. But he did not hear the winds, and no thought of the snow troubled him, as he slept on hour after hour. The night passed, the light snow had ceased, no trace of it was left on the earth and the brilliant sunshine flooded the ancient capital with warmth. People went about with their usual pursuits. Old men and old women sold sweets, hot coffee, and tortillas and frijoles, also hot in the streets. Little plaster images of the saints and the virgin were exposed on trays. Donkeys loaded with vegetables that had been brought across the lakes bumped on one another in the narrow ways. Many officers in fine uniforms and many soldiers in uniforms not so fine could be seen. Whatever else Mexico might be, it was martial. The great Santa Anna, whom men called another Napoleon, now ruled, and there was talk of war and glory. Much of it was vague, but of one thing they were certain. Santa Anna could soon crush the mutinous Texans in the wild north. Gringos they were, always pushing where they were not wanted, and, however hard their fate, they would deserve it. The vein of cruelty which, despite great virtues, had made Spain a byword among nations showed in her descendants. But the boy, Edward Fulton, sleeping in the chapel of the great cathedral, knew nothing of it. Nature, too long defrauded, was claiming payment of her debt, and he slept peacefully on, although the hours passed and noon came. The church had long been open. Priests came and went in the aisles and entered some of the chapels. Worshippers, most of them women, knelt before the shrines. Service was held at the high altar, and the odor of incense filled the great nave. Yet the boy was still in sanctuary, and a kindly angel was watching over him. No one entered the chapel in which he slept. It was almost the middle of the afternoon when he awoke. He heard a faint murmur of voices, and a pleasant odor came to his nostrils. He quickly remembered everything, and, stirring a little on the wooden couch, he found a certain stiffness in the joints. He realized, however, that all his strength had come back. But Ned Fulton understood, although he had escaped from prison and found shelter and sanctuary in the cathedral, that he was yet in an extremely precarious position. The murmur of voices told him that people were in the church, and he had no doubt that the odor came from burning incense. A little light from the narrow window fell upon him. It came through colored glass, and made red and blue splotches on his hands, at which he looked curiously. He knew that it was a brilliant day outside, and he longed for air and exercise, but he dared not move, except to stretch his arms and legs, until the stiffness and soreness disappeared from his joints. Contact with Spaniard and Mexican had taught him the full need of caution. He was very hungry again, and now he was thankful for the restraint of the night before. 
He ate the rest of the food in his pockets and waited patiently. Ned knew that he had slept a long time, and that it must be late in the day. He was confirmed in his opinion by the angle at which the light entered the window, and he decided that he would lie in the pew until night came again. It was a trying test. School his will as he would, he felt at times that he must come from his covert and walk about the chapel. The narrow wooden pew became a casket in which he was held, and now and then he was short of breath. Yet he persisted. He was learning very young the value of will, and he forced himself every day to use it and increase his strength. In such a position, and with so much threatening him, his faculties became uncommonly keen. He heard the voices more distinctly, and also the footsteps of the priests in the felt slippers. They passed the door of the chapel in which he lay, and once or twice he thought they were going to enter, but they seemed merely to pause at the door. Then he would hold his breath until they were gone. At last, and with infinite joy, he saw the colored lights fade, the window itself grew dark, and the murmur in the church but he did not come forth from a secure refuge until it was quite dark. He staggered from stiffness at first, but the circulation was soon restored. Then he looked from the door of the chapel into the great nave. An old priest in a brown robe was extinguishing the candles. Ned watched him until he had put out the last one and disappeared in the rear of the church. Then he came forth and, standing in the great gloomy nave, tried to decide what to do next. He had found a night's shelter and no more. He had escaped from prison, but not from the city of Mexico, and his Texas was yet a thousand miles away. Ned found the little door by which he had entered and passed outside, hiding again among the trees of the Zucalo. The night was very cold, and he shivered once more as he stood there waiting. The night was so dark that the cathedral was almost a formless bulk, but above it the light of the slender lantern shone like a friendly star. While he looked, the great bell of Santa Maria de Guadalupe in the western tower began to chime, and presently the smaller bell of Donna Maria in the eastern tower joined. It was the mellow song they sung, and they sang fresh courage into the young fugitive's veins. He knew that he could never again see this cathedral built upon the site of the great Aztec Tocali, destroyed by the Spaniards more than three hundred years before, and without a throb of gratitude. Ned's first resolve was to take measures from protection from the cold. Then he placed his silver dollars in the most convenient pocket. Then he left the trees and moved towards the east, passing in front of the handsome church Sagario Metropolitano, and entering a very narrow street that led among a maze of small buildings. The district was lighted faintly by a few hanging lanterns, but, as Ned had hoped, some of the shops were yet open. The people who sat here and there in the low doorways were mostly short of stature and dark and broad of face. The Indian in them predominated over the Spaniard, and some were pure Aztec. Ned judged that they would not take any deep interest in the fortunes of the rulers, Spanish or Mexican, royalist or republican. He pulled his cap over his eyes and a little to one side and strolled on, humming an old Mexican air. His walk was the swagger of a young Mexican gallant, and in the dimness they would not notice his northern fairness. Several pairs of eyes observed him, but not with disapproval. They considered him a trim Mexican lad. Some of the men in the doorways took up the air that he was whistling and continued it. He saw soon the place for which he was looking, a tiny shop in which an old Indian sold serapes. He stopped in the doorway, which he filled, and took down one of the best and heaviest, and held out the number of dollars, which he considered an adequate price. The Indian shook his head and asked for nearly twice as much. Ned knew how long they bargained in Shafford in Mexico, and what a delight they took in it. After an hour's talk, he could secure the serape, and at the price he offered, but he dared not linger in one place. Already the old Indian was looking at him inquiringly. Doubtless he had seen that this was no Mexican, but Ned judged shrewdly that he would not let the fact interfere with a promising bargain. The boy acted promptly. He added two more silver dollars to the amount that he had proffered, put the hole in the old Indian's palm, took down the serape, folded it over his arm, and with a gracia, senor, backed swiftly out of the shop. The old Indian was too much astonished to move for at least half a minute. Then, tightly clutching the silver in his hand, he ran to the street. But the tall young senor, with the serape already wrapped around his shoulders, was disappearing in the darkness. The Indian opened his palm and looked at the silver. A smile passed over his face. After all, it was two good Spanish dollars more than he had expected, and he returned contentedly to his shop. If such generous young gentlemen came along every night, his fortune would soon be made. Ned soon left the shop far behind. It was a fine serape, very large, thick, and warm, and he draped himself in it in true Mexican fashion. It kept him warm, and, wrapped in its folds, he looked much more like a genuine Mexican. He had but little money left, but among the more primitive people beyond the capital one might work his way. If suspected, he could claim to be English, and Mexico was not at war with England. 
He bought a sombrero at another shop, with almost the last of his money, then started toward La Viga, the canal that leads from the lower part of the city toward the freshwater lakes, Chalco and Zocamico. He hoped to find at the canal one of the Bergantines, or flat-bottomed boats, in which vegetables, fruit, and flowers were brought to the city for sale. They were good-natured people, those of the Bergantines, and they would not scorn the offer of a stout lad to help with sail and oar. Hidden in his serape and sombrero, and secure in his knowledge of Spanish and Mexican, he now advanced boldly through the more populous and better-lighted parts of the city. He even lingered a little while in front of a café, where men were playing guitar and mandolin, and girls were dancing with castanets. The sight of light and life pleased the boy who had been in prison so long. These people were diverting themselves, and they smiled and laughed. They seemed to have kindly feelings for everybody. But he remembered that cruel Spanish strain, often dormant but always there, and he hastened on. Three officers, their swords swinging at their thighs, came down the narrow street abreast. At another time, Ned would not have given way, and even now it hurt him to do so, for prudence made him step from the sidewalk. One of them laughed and implied an insulting epithet to the peon, but Ned bore it and continued, his sombrero pulled down well over his eyes. His course now led him by the great palace of Euterba Day, where he saw many windows blazing with light. Several officers were entering, and chief among them he recognized General Martin Perfecto de Cos the Mexican brother-in-law of Santa Anna, whom Ned believed to be a treacherous and cruel man. He hastened away from such an unhealthy proximity and came to La Viga. He saw a rude wharf along the canal and several boats, all with the sails furled except two. These two might be returning to the freshwater lakes, and it was possible that he could secure passage. The people of the Burgantines were always humble peons, and they cared little for the intrigues of the capital. It was now about eleven o'clock, and the night had lightened somewhat, a fair moon showing. Ned could see distinctly the boats, or burgantines, as the Mexicans had called them. They were large, flat of bottom, shallow of draft, and were propelled with both sail and oar. He was repulsed at the first, where a surly Mexican of middle age told him with a curse that he wanted no one to help. But at the next, which has at as a crew a man, a woman, evidently his wife, and two half-grown boys, he was more fortunate. Could he use an oar? He could. Then he might come, because there was little promise of wind, and the sails would be of no use. A strong arm would help, as it was sixteen miles down to La Viga, to the lake of Chocimilco, on the shores of which they lived. The boys were tired and sleepy, and he could serve very well in their stead. Ned took his place in the boat, truly thankful that in this crisis of his life he knew how to row. He saw that his hosts, or rather those for whom he worked, were an ordinary peon family, at least half Indian, sluggish of mind and kind of heart. They had brought vegetables and flowers to the city, and now they were thriftily returning in the night to their home on the lake that Benito Igoritos and his sons might not miss the next day from their work. Igoritos and Ned took the oars. The two boys stretched themselves on the bottom of the boat and were asleep in an instant. Juana, the wife, spread a serape over them, and then sat down in Turkish fashion in the center of the Bergantine, a great red and yellow rebozo about her head and shoulders. Sometimes she looked at her husband, and sometimes at the strange boy. He had spoken to them in good Mexican. He dressed like a Mexican, and he walked like a Mexican, but she had not been deceived. She knew that the Mexican part of him ended with the serape and the sombrero. She wondered why he had come, and why he was so anxious to get to the lake of Chocomilco. But she reflected, with the patience and resignation of an oppressed race, that it was no business of hers. He was a good youth. He had spoken to her with compliments, as one often speaks to a lady of high degree, and he bent manfully on the oar. He was welcome. But he must have a name, and she would know it. "'What do you call yourself?' she asked. "'William,' he replied. "'I come from a far country, England, "'and it is my pleasure to travel in new lands and see new peoples.' "'William,' she said gravely, "'you are far from your friends.' "'Ned bent his head in assent. "'Her simple words made him feel that he was indeed far from his own land "'and surrounded by a thousand perils. "'The woman did not speak again, "'and they moved on with an even stroke down the canal, "'which had a uniform width of about thirty feet.' They were still passing houses of stone and others of adobe, but before they had gone a mile, they were halted by a sharp command from the shore. An officer and three soldiers, one of whom held a lantern, stood on the bank. Ned had expected that they would be stopped. These were revolutionary times, and people could not go in or out of the city unnoticed. Particularly was La Viga guarded. He knew that his fate now rested with Benito Igaritos and his wife Juana, but he trusted them. The officer was peremptory, and the Burgantine was most innocent in appearance. Merely a humble vegetable boat returning down La Viga after a successful day in the city. Your family? Ned heard the officer say to Benito as he flashed a lantern in turn upon every one. 
Taciturn, like most men of the oppressed races, Benito nodded, while his wife sat silent in her great red and yellow rebozo. Ned leaned carelessly upon the oar, but his face was well hid by the sombrero, and his heart was throbbing. When the light of the lantern passed over him, he felt as if he were being seared by a flame, but the officer had no suspicion, and with a gruff, pass on. He withdrew from the bank with his men. Benito nodded to Ned, and they pulled again to the center of La Viga. Neither spoke, nor did the woman. Ned bent on the oar with renewed strength. He felt that the greatest of his dangers was now past, and the relief of the spirit brought fresh strength. The night lightened yet more. He saw on the low banks of the canal green shrubs and many plants with spikes and thorns. It seemed to him characteristic of Mexico that nearly everything should have its spikes and thorns. Through the gray night showed background of the distant mountains. They overtook and passed two other brigantines returning from the city, and they met a third on its way thither with vegetables for the morning market. Benito knew the owners and exchanged a brief word with everyone as he passed. Ned pulled silently at his oar. When it was far past midnight, Ned felt a cool breeze rising. Benito began to unfurl the sail. You have pulled well, young senor, he said to Ned, but the oar is needed no more. Now the wind will work for us. You will sleep and Carlos will help me. He awoke the elder of the two boys. Ned was so tired that his arms ached and he was glad to rest. He wrapped his heavy serape around himself, lay down in the bottom of the boat, pillowed his head on his arm and went to sleep. When he awoke, it was day and they were floating on the broad sheet of shallow water, which he knew instinctively was Jocomilco. The wind was still blowing and one of the boys steered the Burgantine. Benito, Juana, and the other boys sat up, with their faces turned toward the rosy morning light, as if they were sun worshippers. Ned also felt the inspiration. The world was purer and clearer here than in the city. In the early morning, the grayish, lonely tint, which was the prevailing note of Mexico, did not show. The vegetation was green, or it was tinted with the glow of the sun. Near the lower shores, he saw the chiampas, or floating gardens. Benito turned the brigantine into a cove, and they went ashore. His house, flat-roofed and built of adobe, was near, standing in a field, filled with spiky and thorny plants. They gave Ned a breakfast, the ordinary peasant fare of the country, but in abundance, and then the woman, who seemed to be in a good sense the spokesman of the family, said very gravely, You are a good boy, William, and you rode well. What more do you wish of us? Benito also bent his dark eyes upon him in serious inquiry. Ned was not prepared for any reply. He did not know just what to do, and on impulse he answered, I would stay with you a while and work. You will not find me lazy. He waved his hand toward the spiky and thorny field. Benito consulted briefly with his wife, and they agreed. For three or four days, Ned toiled in the hot field with Benito and the boys, and at night he slept on the floor of earth. The work was hard, and it made his body sore. The food was of the roughest, but these things were trifles compared with the gift of freedom which he had received. How glorious it was to breathe the fresh air, and to only have the sky for a roof and the horizon for walls. Benito and the older boy again took the brigantine loaded with vegetables up La Viga to the city. They did not suggest that Ned go with them. He remained working in the field and trying to think of some way in which he could obtain money for a journey. The wind was good, the brigantine traveled fast, and Benito and his boy returned speedily. Benito greeted Ned with a grave salute, but said nothing until an hour later, when they sat by a fire outside the hut, eating tortillas and frijoles which Juana had cooked for them. "'What is the news of the capital?' asked Ned. Benito pondered his reply. The president, the protector of us all, the great Santa Ana, grows more angry at the Texans, the wild Americans who have come into the wilderness of the far north, he replied. They talk of an army going soon against them, and they talk, too, of a daring escape. He paused and contemplatively lit a cigarito. What was the escape? asked Ned, the pulse on his wrist beginning to beat hard. One of the Texans, whom the great Santa Ana holds, but a boy they say he was, though fierce, slipped between the bars of his window and is gone. They wish to get him back. They are anxious to take him again for reasons that are too much for Benito. Do you think they will find them? How do I know? But they say he is yet in the capital, and there is a reward of one hundred good Spanish dollars for the one who will bring him in, or who will tell where he is to be found. Benito quietly puffed at his cigarito, and Juana, the cooking being over, threw ashes on the coals. If he is still hiding within the reach of Santa Anna's arm, said Ned, somebody is sure to betray him for the reward. I do not know, said Benito, tossing away the stub of his cigarito. Then he rose and began to work in the field. Ned went out with the elder boy, Carlos, and caught fish. They did not return until twilight, and the others were already waiting placidly while Juana prepared their food. 
None of them could read, they had little, their life was most primitive, but Ned noticed that they never spoke cross words to one another. They seemed to be entirely content. After supper they sat down on the ground in front of the adobe hut. The evening was clear, and already many stars were coming into a blue sky. The surface of the lake was silver, rippling lightly, Benito smoked luxuriously. I saw this afternoon a friend of mine, Miguel Lampridi, he said after a while. He had just come down La Viga from the city. What news did he bring? asked Edward. They are still searching everywhere for the young Texan who went through the window. Eduardo Fulton is his name. Truly General Santa Anna must have his reasons. The reward has been doubled. Poor lad, spoke Juana, who spoke seldom. It may be that the young Texan is not as bad as they say, but it is much money that they offer. Someone will find him. It may be, said Benito. Then they sat a long time in silence. Juana was the first to go into the house and to bed. After a while, the two boys followed. Another half hour passed, and Ned rose. I go, Benito, he said. You and your wife have been good to me. I cannot bring a misfortune upon you. Why is it that you did not betray me? The reward is large, and you would have been a rich man here. Benito laughed low. Yes, it would have been much money, he replied. But what use have I for it? I have the wife I wish, and my sons are good sons. We do not go hungry, and we sleep well. So it will be all the days of our life. Two hundred silver dollars would bring two hundred evil spirits upon us. Thy face, young Texan, is a good face, and I think so, and my wife, Juana, who knows, says so. Yet it is best that you go. Others will soon learn, and it is hard to live between close stone walls when the war free world is so beautiful. I will call Juana, and she, too, will tell you farewell. We would not drive you away, but since you choose to go, you shall not leave without a kind word, which may go with you as a blessing on your way. He called at the door of the adobe hut. Juana came forth. She was stout, and she had never been beautiful, but her face seemed very pleasant to Ned, as she had asked the Holy Virgin to watch over him in his wanderings. I have five silver dollars, said Benito. They are yours. They will make the way shorter. But Ned refused absolutely to accept them. He would not take the store of people who had been so kind to him. Instead, he offered the single dollar that he had left for a heavy knife like a machete. Benito brought it to him and reluctantly took the dollar. Do not try the northern way, Texan, he said. It is too far. Go over the mountains to Veracruz, where you will find passage on a ship. It seemed good advice to Ned, and, although the change of plan was abrupt, he promised to take it. Juana gave him a bag of food, which he fastened to his belt under his serape, and at midnight, with the blessing of the Holy Virgin invoked for him again, he started. Fifty yards away, he turned and saw the man and woman standing before their door and gazing at him. He waved his hand, and they returned the salute. He walked on again, a little mist before his eyes. They had been very kind to him, these poor people of another race. He walked along the shore of the lake for a long time, and then bore in towards the east, intending to go parallel with the great road to Veracruz. His step was brisk and his heart high. He felt more courage and hope than at any other time since he had been dropped from the prison. He had food for several days, and the possession of a heavy knife was a great comfort. He could slash with it as with a hatchet. He walked steadily for hours. The road was rough, but he was young and strong. Once he passed the Pedregal, a region where an old lava flow had cooled, and which presented to his feet numerous sharp edges like those of a knife. He had good shoes with heavy soles, and he knew their value. On the long march before him they were worth as much as bread and weapons, and he picked his way as carefully as a walker on a tightrope. He was glad when he had crossed the dangerous Pedregal, and entered a cypress forest, clustering on a low hill. Grass grew here also, and he rested a while, wrapped in his serape against the coolness of the night. He saw behind and now below him the city, the towers of the churches outlined against the city. It was from some such place as this that Cortez and his men, embarked upon the world's most marvelous adventure, had looked down for the first time upon the ancient city of Tenochtitlan, but it did not beckon to Ned. It seemed to him that a mighty menace to his beloved Texas emanated from it, and he must warn the Texans. He sprang to his feet and resumed his journey. At the eastern edge of the hill, he came upon a beautiful little spring, leaping from the rock. He drank from it and went on. Lower down, he saw some adobe huts among the cypresses and cactus. No doubt their occupants were sound asleep, but for safety's sake, he curved away from them. Dogs barked, and when they barked again, the sound showed that they were coming nearer. He ran, rather from caution than fear. Because if the dogs attacked, he wished to be so far away from the huts that their owners would not be awakened. Now he gave thanks that he had the machete. He thrust his hands under the serape and clutched its strong handle. It was a truly formidable weapon. He came to another little hill, also clothed in cypress, and began to ascend it with decreased speed. 
The bang of the dogs was growing much louder. They were coming fast. Near the summit, he saw a heap of rock, probably an Aztec tumulus, six or seven feet high. Ned smiled with satisfaction. Pressed by danger, his mind was quick. He was where he would make his defense, and he did not think it would need to be a long one. He settled himself well upon the top of the tumulus and drew his machete. The dogs, six in number, coursed among the cypresses, and the leader, foam in his mouth, leaped straight at Ned. The boy involuntarily drew up his feet a little, but he was not shaken from the crouching position that was best suited to a below. As the hound was in mid-air, he swung the machete with all his might and struck straight at the ugly head. The heavy blade crashed through the skull, and the dog fell dead without a sound. Another, which leaped also, but not so far, received a deep cut across the shoulder. It fell back and retreated with the others among the cypresses, where the unwounded dogs watched with red eyes the formidable figure on the rocks. But Ned did not remain on the tumulus more than a few minutes longer. When he sprang down, the dogs growled, but he shook the machete until it glittered in the moonlight. With howls of terror they fled, while he resumed his journey in the other direction. Near morning he came into country which seemed to him very wild. The soil was hard and dry, but there was a dense growth of giant cactus, with patches here and there of thorny bushes. Guarding well against the spikes and thorns, he crept into one of the thickets and lay down. He must rest and sleep, and already the touch of rose in the east was heralding the dawn. Sleep by day and flight by night, he was satisfied with himself. He had really succeeded better so far than he had hoped, and guarded by the spikes and thorns, slumber took him before dawn had spread from east to west. End of chapter 3. This was a reading by Mr. Duck. Chapter 4 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Mr. Duck, The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller, Chapter 4. Ned awoke about noon. The morning had been cold, but having been wrapped very thoroughly in the great serape, he had remained snug and warm all through his long sleep. He rose very cautiously, lest the spikes and thorns should get him, and then went to a comparatively open place among the giant cactus stems, whence he could see over the hills and valleys. He saw in the valley nearest him the flat roofs of a small village. Columns of smoke rose from two or three of the adobe houses, and he heard the faint, mellow voices of men singing in a field. Women by the side of a small but swift stream were pounding and washing clothes after the primitive fashion. Looking eastward, he saw hills and a small mountain, but all the country in that direction seemed to be extremely arid and repellent. The bare basalts of volcanic origin showed everywhere, and, even at the distance, he could see many deep quarries in the stone, where races older, doubtless, than Aztecs and Toltecs had obtained material for building. It was always Ned's feeling when in Mexico that he was in an old, old land, not ancient like England or France, but as ancient as Egypt and Babylon are ancient. He had calculated his course very carefully, and he knew that it would lead through this desert, volcanic region, but on the whole he was not sorry. Mexicans would be scarce in such a place. He remained a lad of stout heart, confident that he would succeed. He ate sparingly, and reckoned that with self-denial he had food enough to last three days. He might obtain more on the road by some happy chance or other. Then, becoming impatient, he started again, keeping well among cypress and cactus, and laying his course toward the small mountain that he saw ahead. He pressed forward the remainder of the afternoon, coming once or twice near to the great road that led to Veracruz. On one occasion he saw a small body of soldiers, deep in dust, marching towards the port. All except the officers were peons, and they did not seem to Ned to show much martial ardor. But the officers on horseback sternly bade them hasten. Ned, as usual, had much sympathy for the poor peasants, but none for the officers who drove them on. About sunset he came to a little river, the Tiahuacan, he learned afterward, and he still saw before him the low mountain, the name of which was Cerro Gordo. But his attention was drawn from the mountain by two elevations rising almost at the bank of the river, a pyramidal in shape and truncated, and the larger, which Ned surmised to be anywhere from five hundred to a thousand feet square, seemed to rise in a height of two or three hundred feet. The other was about two-thirds the size of the larger, both in area and height. Although there was much vegetation clinging about them, Ned knew that these were pyramids erected by the hand of man. The feeling that this was a land old like Egypt came back to him most powerfully in the presence of these ancient mountains, which were, in fact, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. There they stood, desolate and of untold age. The setting sun poured an intense red light upon them, until they stood out vivid and enlarged. 
So far as Ned knew, no other human being was anywhere near. The loneliness in the presence of those tremendous ruins was overpowering. He longed for human companionship. A peon, despite the danger otherwise, would have been welcome. The whole land took on fantastic aspects. It was not normal and healthy like the regions from which he came north of the Rio Grande. Every nerve quivered. Then he did the bravest thing that any one could do in such a position, forcing his will to win a victory over weirdness and superstition. He crossed the shallow river and advanced boldly toward the Pyramid of the Sun. His reason told him that there was no such thing as ghosts, but it told him also that Mexican peons were likely to believe in them, hence it was probable that he would be safer about the pyramid than far from it. The country bade fair to become too rough for night traveling, and he would stop there a while, refreshing his strength. Although the sun was setting, the color of the skies promised a bright night, and Ned approached boldly. As usual, his superstitious fears became weaker as he approached the objects that had called them into existence. But before he reached the pyramids, he found that he was among many ruins. They stood all about him, stone fragments of ancient walls, black basalt or lava, and, unless the twilight deceived him, there were also traces of ancient streets. He saw, too, south of the larger pyramids, a great earthwork or citadel, thirty or forty feet high, enclosing a square in which stood a small pyramid. The walls of the earthwork were enormously thick. Three hundred feet, Ned reckoned, and upon it, at regular intervals, stood other small pyramids, fourteen in number. Scattered all about, alone or in groups, were tumuli, and leading away from the largest group of tumuli, Ned saw a street or causeway, which, passing by the Pyramid of the Sun, ended in front of the Pyramid of the Moon, where it widened out into a great circle, with a tumulus standing at the center. Despite all the courage that he had shown, Ned felt a superstitious thrill as he looked at these ancient and solemn ruins. He and they were absolutely alone. Antiquity looked down upon him. The sun was gone now, and the moon was coming out, touching pyramids and tumuli, earthworks and causeway with ghostly silver, deepening the effect of loneliness in far-off time. While Ned was looking at these majestic remains, he heard the sound of voices and then the rattle of weapons. He saw through the twilight the glitter of uniforms and of swords and sabers. A company of Mexican soldiers, at least a hundred in number, had come into the ancient city and, no doubt, intended to camp there. Being so absorbed in the strange ruins, he had not noticed them sooner. As the men were already scattering in search of firewood or other needs of the camp, Ned saw that he was in great danger. He hid behind a tumulus, half covered by the vegetation that had grown from its crevices. He was glad that his serape was of modest brown, instead of the bright colors that most of the Mexicans loved. A soldier passed within ten feet of him, but in the twilight did not notice him. It was enough to make one quiver. Another passed a little later, and he too failed to see the fugitive. But a third, if he came, would probably see, and leaving the tumulus, Ned ran to another where he hid again for a few minutes. It was the boy's object to make off through the neighboring forest after passing from tumulus to tumulus, but he found soon that another body of soldiers was camping on the far side of the ruined city. He might or might not run the gauntlet in the darkness. The probabilities were that he would not, and hiding behind a tumulus almost midway between the two forces, he took thought of his next step. The pyramid of the moon rose almost directly before him, its truncated mass spotted with foliage. Ned could see that its top was flat, and instantly he took a bold resolution. He made his way to the base of the pyramid, and began to climb slowly and with great care, always keeping hidden in the vegetation. He was certain that no Mexican would follow where he was going. They were on other business, and their incurious minds bothered little about a city that was dead and gone for them. Up he went steadily over uneven terraces, and from below he heard the chatter of the soldiers. A third fire had been lighted much nearer the pyramid, and pausing a moment he looked down. Twenty or thirty soldiers were scattered about this fire. Their muskets were stacked, and they were taking their ease. Discipline was relaxed. One man was strumming a mandolin already, and two or three began to sing. But Ned saw sentinels walking among the tumuli and along the Calle de los Muertos, which led from the citadel to the southern front of the Pyramid of the Moon. He was very glad now that he had sought this lofty refuge, and he renewed his climb. As he drew himself upon another terrace, he saw before him a dark opening into the very mass of the pyramid, which was built either of brick or of stone. He could not tell which. He thought once of creeping in and of hiding there, but after taking a couple steps into the dark, he drew back. He was afraid of plunging into some well, and he continued the ascent. He was now about sixty or seventy feet up, but he was not yet halfway to the top of the pyramid. He was so slow and cautious that it took more than a half hour to reach the crest. 
where he found himself upon a platform about twenty feet square. It was an irregular surface, with much vegetation growing from the crevices, and here Ned felt quite safe. Near him, and sixty feet above him, rose the crest of the Pyramid of the Sun. Beyond were the ranges of mountains silvery in the moonlight. He walked to the edge of the pyramid and looked down. Four or five fires were burning now, and a single mandolin had grown to four. Several guitars were being plucked vigorously also, and the sound of the instruments joined with that of the singing voices, which was very musical and pleasant. These Mexicans seemed to be full of good nature, and so they were, with fire, food, and music in plenty. But now that he had been their prisoner, Ned never forgot how that dormant and Spanish strain of cruelty in their natures could flame high under the influence of passion. The dungeons of Spanish Mexico and of the New Mexico hid many dark stories, and he believed that he had read what lay behind the smiling mask of Santa Anna's face. He would suffer everything to keep out of Mexicans' hands. He crept away from the edge of the pyramid and chose a place near its center for his lofty camp. There was much vegetation growing out of the ancient masonry, and he had a fear of scorpions and other more dangerous reptiles, perhaps. But he threshed up grass and weeds well with his machete. Then he sat down and ate his supper. Fortunately, he had drunk copiously at a brook before reaching the ruined city, and he did not suffer from thirst. Then, relying upon the isolation of his perch for safety, he wrapped himself in the invaluable sarape and lay down. The night was as cold as usual, and a sharp wind blew from the northern peaks and ranges, but Ned, protected by vegetation and the heavy serape, had an extraordinary feeling of warmth and snugness as he lay on the old pyramid. Held so long within close walls, the wild freedom and the fresh air that came across seas and continents were very grateful to him. Even the presence of an enemy so near, and yet, as it seemed, so little dangerous, added a certain piquancy to his position. The pleasant tinkle of the mandolins was wafted upward to him, and it was wonderfully soothing, telling of peace and rest. He inhaled the aromatic odors of strange and flowering southern plants, and his senses were steeped in a sort of luxurious calm. He fell asleep to the music of the mandolin, and when he awoke, such a brilliant sun was shining in his eyes that he was glad to close and open them again several times before they would tolerate the brilliant Mexican sky that bent above him. He lay still about five minutes, listening, and then, to his disappointment, he heard sounds below. He judged by the position of the sun that it must be at least ten o'clock in the morning, and the Mexicans should be gone. Yet they were undoubtedly still there. He crept to the edge of the pyramid and looked over. There was the Mexican force, scattered about the ruined city, but encamped in great numbers along the Calle de los Muertos. Their numbers had been increased by two hundred or three hundred, and Ned saw no signs of breaking camp. He judged that this was a rendezvous, and that there were more troops yet to come. He saw at once that his problem was increased greatly. He could not dream of leaving the summit of the pyramid before the next night came. Food he had in plenty, but no water, and, already as the hot sun's rays approached the vertical, he felt a great thirst. Imagination and the knowledge that he could not allay it, for the present at least, increased the burning sensation in his throat and the dryness of his lips. He caught a view of the current of the Teohuacan, the little river by which the pyramids stand, and the sight increased his torments. He had never seen such fresh and pure water. It sparkled and raced in the sun before him, and it looked divine, and yet it was as far out of his reach as if it were all the way across Mexico. Ned went back to the place where he slept and sat down. The sight of the river had tortured him, and he felt better when it was shut from view. Now he resolved to see what would be accomplished by will. He undertook to forget the water, and at times he succeeded, but, despite his greatest efforts, the Tihuacan would come back now and then in the most astonishing vividness. Although he was lying on the serape with bushes and shrubs all around, there was the river visible to the eye of imagination, brighter, fresher, and more sparkling than ever. He could not control his fancy, but will ruled the body, and he did not stir from his place for hours. The sun beat fiercely upon him, and the thin bushes and shrubs afforded little protection. Toward the northern edge of the pyramid, a small palm was growing out of a large crevice in the masonry, and it might have given some shade, but it was in such an exposed position that Ned did not dare to use it for fear of discovery. How he hated that sun! It seemed to be drying him up through and through, causing the very blood in his veins to evaporate. Why should such hot days follow such cold nights? When his tongue touched the roof of his mouth, it felt rough and hot like a coal. Perhaps the Mexicans had gone away. It seemed to him that he had not heard any sounds from them for a long time. He went to the edge of the pyramid and looked over. No, the Mexicans were yet there, and the sight of them filled him with a fierce anger. They were enjoying themselves. Tents were scattered about, and shelters of boughs had been erected. Many soldiers were taking their siestas. 
Nobody was working, and there was not the slightest sign that they intended to depart that day. Ned's hot tongue clove to the roof of his hot mouth, but he obstinately refused to look at the river. He did not think that he could stand another side of it. He went back to his little lair among the shrubs and prayed for night, blessed night with its cooling touch. He had a horrible apprehension, which amounted to conviction, that the troops would stay there for several days, awaiting some maneuver, or perhaps making it a rallying point, and that in his hiding place in the pyramid, he was in as bad a case as a sailor cast on a desert island without water. Nothing seemed left for him but to steal down and try to escape in darkness. Thus night would be doubly welcome, and he prayed for it again, and with renewed fervor. Some hours are ten times as long as others, but the longest of all come to an end at last. The sun began to droop in the west, the vertical glare was gone, and yet the masonry where it was bare was yet hot to the touch. It, too, cooled soon. The sun dropped wholly down, and darkness came over all the earth. Then the fever in Ned's throat died down somewhat, and the blood began to flow again in his veins. It seemed as if a dew touched his face, delicious, soothing like drops of rain in the burning desert. He rose and stretched his stiffened limbs. Overhead spread the dark, cool sky, and the bright stars were coming out, one by one. After the first few moments of relief, he heard the cry for water again. Despite the night and the coming chill, he knew that it would make itself heard often and often, and he began to study the possibilities of a descent. But he saw the fires spread out again, on all sides of the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, and flame thickly along the Calle de los Mortos. It did not seem that he could pass even on the blackest night. He moved over toward the northern edge of the pyramid, and stood under the palm which he had noticed in the day. One of its broad green leaves, swayed by the wind, touched him softly in the face. He looked up. It was a friendly palm. Its very touch was kindly. He stroked the blades, and then he examined the stem or body minutely. He was a studious boy who had read much. He had heard of the water palm of the Hawaiian and the Southern Sea Islands. Might not the water palm be found in Mexico also? In any event, he had never heard of a palm that was poisonous. They were always the givers of life. He raised the machete and slashed the stem of the palm at a point about five feet from the ground. The wound gaped open and a stream of water gushed forth. Ned applied his mouth at once and drank long and deeply. It was not poison, nor was it any bitter juice. This was the genuine water palm, yielding up to the living fluid of its arteries for him. He drank as long as the gash gave forth water, and then sat down under the blades of the palm, content and thankful, realizing that there was always hope in the very heart of despair. Ned sat a long time, feeling the new life rushing into his veins. He ate from the food of which he had a plentiful supply, and once more gave thanks to Benito and Juana. Then he stood up, and the broad leaves of the palm waving gently in the wind touched his face again. He reached up his hand and stroked them. The palm was to him almost a thing of life. He went to the edge of the pyramid and strove for a sight of the Teohuacan. He caught it at last the flash of its waters in the moonlight, and shook his fist in defiance. I can do without you now, was his thought. The sight of you does not torture me. He returned to his usual place of sleep. As long as he had a water supply, it was foolish of him to attempt an escape through the Mexican lines. He was familiar now with every square inch of the twenty feet square of the crowning platform of the pyramid. It seemed that he had been there for weeks, and began to have the feeling that it was home. Once more hunger and thirst satisfied, he sought sleep and slept within the deep peace of youth. Ned awoke from his second night on the pyramid before dawn was complete. There was a silvery light in the east over the desolate ranges but the west was yet a dark blur. He looked down and saw that nearly all the soldiers were still asleep, while those who did not sleep were as motionless as if they were. In the half-light, the lost city, the tumuli, and the ruins of the old buildings took on strange and fantastic shapes. The feeling that he was among the dead, the dead for many centuries, returned to Ned with overpowering effect. He thought of Aztec and Toltec, and people back of all these who had built this city. The Mexicans below were intruders like himself. He shook himself as if by physical effort he could get rid of the feeling, and then went to the water palm in which he cut another gash. Again the fountain gushed forth and he drank, but the palm was a small one. There was too little soil among the crevices of the ancient masonry to support a larger growth, and he saw that it could not satisfy his thirst more than a day or two. But anything might happen in that time, and his courage suffered no decrease. He retreated toward the center of the platform, as the day was now coming fast after the southern fashion. The whole circle of the heavens seemed to burst into a blaze of light, and, in a few hours, the sun was hotter than it had been the day before. Many sounds now came from the camp below, but Ned, although he often looked eagerly, saw no signs of coming departure. Shortly after noon, there was a great blare of trumpets, and a detachment of lancers rode up. They were large men, mounted finely, and the heads of their long lances glittered as they brandished them in the sun. 
Ned's attention was drawn to the leader of this new detachment, an officer in most brilliant uniform, and he started. He knew him at once. It was the brother-in-law of Santa Anna, General Martin Perfecto de Cos, a man in whom that old, cruel strain was very strong, and whom Ned believed to be charged with the crushing of the Texans. Then he was right in the surmise that Mexican forces for the campaign were gathering here on the banks of the Tihuacan. More troops came in the afternoon, and the boy no longer had the slightest doubt. The camp spread out farther and farther and assumed military form. Not so many men were lounging about, and the tinkling of the guitars ceased. Ned could see General de Cos plainly, a heavy man of dark face, autocratic and domineering in manner. Night came, and the boy went once more to the palm. When he struck with his machete, the water came forth, but in a much weaker stream. In reality, he was yet thirsty after he drank the full flow, and he would not cut into the stem again. He knew that he must practice the severest economy with his water supply. The third night came, and as soon as he was safe from observation, Ned slashed the palm once more. The day had been very hot, and his thirst was great. The water came forth, but with only half the vigor of the morning, which itself had shown a decrease. The poor palm, too, trembled and shook when he cut into it with the machete, and the blades drooped. Ned drank what it supplied and then turned away regretfully. It was a kindly palm, a gift to man, and yet he must slay it to save his own life. He lay down again, but he did not sleep as well as usual. His nerves were upset by the long delay and the decline of the palm, and he was not refreshed when he awoke in the morning. His head felt hot and his limbs were heavy. As it was not yet bright daylight, he went to the palm and cut into it. The flow of water was only a few mouthfuls. Cautious and doubly economical now, he pursed his lips that not a single drop might escape. Then, after eating a little food, he lay down, protected as much as possible by the scanty bushes, and also sheltering himself at times from the sun with a serape which he drew over his head. He felt instinctively, and with the power of conviction, that the Mexicans would not depart. The coming of Cos had taken up the hope from him. Cos! He hated the short, brusque name. It was another day of dazzling brightness and intense heat. Certainly this was a vertical sun. It shot rays like burning arrows straight down. The blood in his veins seemed to dry up again. His head grew hotter. Black specks and myriads danced before his eyes. He looked longingly at his palm. When he first saw it, it stood up, vital and strong. Now it seemed to droop and waver like himself, but it would have enough life to fill his veins and arteries through the day, and at night he would have another good drink. He scarcely stirred throughout the day, but spent most of the time looking at the palm. He paid no attention to the sounds below, sure that the Mexicans would not go away. He fell at times into a sort of fevered stupor, and he aroused himself from the last one to find that night had come. He took his machete, went to the tree, and cut quickly, because his thirst was very great. The gash opened, but not a drop came forth. End of chapter 4 This was a recording by Mr. Duck. Chapter 5 of the Texan Star. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mr. Duck, The Texan Star by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 5. Ned stared, half in amazement, half in despair, yet he had known all the while that this would happen. The palm had emptied every drop from its veins and arteries for him, giving life for life. He had cut so deeply and so often that it would now wither and die. He turned away in sadness, and suddenly a bitter, burning thirst assailed him. It seemed to have leaped into new life with the knowledge that there was nothing now to assuage it. The boy sat down on a small projection of brickwork and considered his case. He had been more than twelve hours without water under a fierce sun. His thirst would not increase so fast at night, but it would increase nevertheless, and the Mexican force might linger below a week. Certainly its camp was of such a character that it would remain at least two or three days, and any risk was preferable to a death of thirst. He could wait no longer. Now chance, which had been so cruel, flung a straw his way. The night was darker than usual, the moon and stars did not come out, and troops of clouds stalked up from the southwest. Ned knew that it was the land of little rain, and for a few moments he had a wild hope that in some manner he might catch enough water for his use on the crest of the pyramid. A reason soon drove the hope away. There was no depression which would hold water, and he resolved instead to make the descent under cover of darkness. When he had come to his resolution, the thirst was not so fierce. Indecision being over, both his physical and mental courage rose. He ate, and had left enough food to last for two days, which he fastened securely in a pack to his body. Then, machete in hand, he looked over the edge of the pyramid. There was some noise in the camp, but most of the soldiers seemed to be at rest. 
Lights flickered here and there, and the ruined city, showing only in fragments through the darkness, looked more ghostly and mournful than ever. Ned waited a long time. Drops of rain began to fall, and the wind moaned with an almost human note around the pyramids and old walls. The rain increased a little, but it never fell in abundance. It and the wind were very cold, and Ned drew the serape very closely about his body. He was anxious now for time to pass fast, because he was beginning to feel afraid, not of the Mexicans, but of the dead city, and the ghosts of those vanished long ago, although he knew there were no such things. But the human note in the wind grew until it was like a shriek, and this shriek was to him a warning that he must go. The pyramid has been his salvation, but his time there was at an end. He drew the sombrero far down over his eyes, and once more calculated the chances. He spoke Spanish well, and he spoke its Mexican variations equally well. If they saw him, he might be able to pass for a Mexican. He must succeed. He lowered himself from the crowning platform of the pyramid, and began the descent. The cold rain pattered upon him, and his body was weak from privation, but his spirit was strong, and with steady hand and foot he went down. He paused several times to look at the camp. Five or six fires still burned there, but they flickered wildly in the wind and rain. He judged that the sentinels would not watch well. For what must they watch? They are in the heart of their own country. But as he approached the bottom, he saw two of these sentinels walking back and forth, their bayonets reflecting a flicker now and then from the flames. He saw also five or six large white tents, and he was quite sure that the largest sheltered at that instant Martin Perfecto de Cos, whom he wished very much to avoid. He intended, when he reached the bottom, to keep as close as he could in the shadow of the pyramid, and then seek the other side of the Teohuacan. The rain was still blown about by the wind, and it was very cold, but the influence of both wind and rain were inspiring to the boy. They were a tonic to body and mind, and he grew bolder as he came nearer to the ground. At last he stepped upon level earth, and stood for a little while black and motionless against the pyramid. He was aware that the cordon of Kos army completely enclosed the Pyramid of the Moon, the Pyramid of the Sun, the Calle de los Muertos, and the other principal ruins, and now he heard the sentinels much more distinctly as they walked back and forth. Straining his eyes, he could see two of them, short, sallow men, musket on shoulder. The beat of one lay directly across the path that he had chosen, reaching from the far edge of the Pyramid of the Moon to a point about twenty yards away. He believed that when this sentinel marched to the other end of his beat, he could slip by. At any rate, if he were seen, he might make a successful flight, and he slipped his hand to the handle of the machete in his belt in order that he might be ready for resistance. He saw presently two or three dark heaps near him, and as his eyes grew used to the darkness, he made out camp equipage and supplies. The smallest heap, which was also nearest to him, consisted of large metal canteens for water, such as soldiers of that day carried. His thirst suddenly made itself manifest again. Doubtless those canteens carried water, and his body which wanted water so badly cried aloud for it. It was not recklessness but a burning thirst which caused him to creep toward the little heap of canteens at the imminent risk of being discovered. When he reached them he lay flat on the ground and took one from the top. He knew by its lack of weight that it was empty, and he laid it aside. Then he paused for a glance at the sentinel who was still walking steadily on his beat, and whom he now saw very clearly. He was disappointed to find the first canteen empty, but he was convinced that some in that heap must contain water, and he would persevere. The second and third failed him in like manner, but he would yet persevere. The fourth was heavy, and when he shook it gently, he heard the water flash. That thirst at once became burning and uncontrollable. The cry of his body to be assuaged overpowered his will, and while deadly danger menaced, he unscrewed the little mouthpiece and drank deep and long. It was not cold, and perhaps a little mud lurked at the bottom of the canteen but like the gift of the water palm, it brought fresh life and strength. He put down the canteen, half empty, and took another from the heap. It, too, proved to be filled, and he hung it around neck and shoulder by the strap that provided for that purpose. He could have found no more precious object for the dry regions through which he intended to make his journey. Ned went back toward the pyramid, but his joy over finding the water made him a little careless. Great fragments of stone lay about everywhere, and his foot slipped on a piece of black basalt. He fell in the metal of his canteen, rang against the stone. He sprang to his feet instantly, but the sentinel had taken the alarm, and as Ned Sombrero had slipped back, he saw the fair face. He knew that it was the face of no Mexican, and shouting, Gringo! He fired straight at him. Luckily, haste in the darkness prevented good aim, although he was at short range. Ned felt the swish of the bullet so close to him that every nerve jumped, and he jumped with them. The first jump took him halfway to the pyramid, and the next landed him at its base. There the second nearest sentinel fired at him, and he heard the bullet flatten himself against the stone. 
Fortunately for Ned, the silent, thoughtful lad, he had often tried to imagine what he would do in critical junctures, and now, despite the terrible crisis, he was able to take control of his nerves. He remembered to pull the sombrero down over his face and to keep close to the pyramid. The shots had caused an uproar in the camp. Men were running about, lights were springing up, and officers were shouting orders. A single fugitive among so many confused pursuers might yet pass for one of them. Chance, which had been against him, was now for him. The wind suddenly took a wilder sweep and the rain lashed harder. He left the pyramid and darted behind a tumulus. He stood there quietly and heard the uproar of the hunt at other points. Presently he slouched away in the manner of a careless peon, with his serape drawn about chin as well as body, for which the wind and rain were a fitting excuse. He also shouted and chattered occasionally with others, and none knew that he was the gringo at whom the two sentinels had fired. Ned thought to make a way through the lines, but so many lights now flared up on all the outskirts that he knew that it was impossible. He turned back again to the side of the pyramid, where he was almost hidden by debris and foliage. Two or three false alarms had been sounded on the other side of the great structure, and practically the whole mob of searchers was drawn away in that direction. He formed a quick decision. He would reascend the pyramid, and he would take with him a water supply in the canteen that he still carried over his shoulder. He began to climb, and he noticed as he went up that it was almost the exact point at which he had ascended before. He heard the tumult below, caught glimpses of lights flashing here and there, and he ascended eagerly. He was almost halfway up when he came face to face with a Mexican soldier who carried in his hand a small lantern. The soldier, the only one perhaps who had suspected the pyramid as a place of refuge, had come at another angle, and there on the terrace the two had met. They were not more than three feet apart. Ned had put his machete back in his belt that he might climb with more ease, but he hit out at once with his clenched right hand. The blow took the Mexican full between the eyes, and toppling over backwards, he dropped the lantern. Then he slid on the narrow terrace, and with an instinctive cry of terror, fell. Ned was seized with horror, and took a hasty glance downward. He was relieved when he saw that the man, grasping at projections and outgrowing vegetation, was sliding rather than falling, and would not be hurt seriously. He turned to his own case. There lay the lantern on the stone, still glowing. Below was the tumult, men coming to his side of the pyramid, drawn by his cry. He could no longer reach the top of the pyramid without being seen, but he knew another way. He snatched up the lantern, tucked it under his serape, and made for the opening which he had noticed in the side of the pyramid at his first ascent. It was scarcely ten feet away, and he boldly stepped in, a thing that he would never have dared to do if had it not been for the happy chance of the lantern. His foot rested on solid stone, and he stood wholly in the dark, yet the uproar came clearly to his ears. It was a certainty now that more soldiers would ascend the pyramid looking for him, but he believed that ignorance and superstition would keep them from entering it. The air that came to his nostrils out of the unknown dark was cold and clean, but he did not yet dare to take out his lantern. He felt cautiously in front of him with one foot and touched a stone step below. He also touched narrow walls with his outstretched hand. He descended to the step, and then, feeling sure that the light of his lantern would not be seen from without, he took it from under his serape and held it out as far in front of him as he could. A narrow flight of stone steps led onward and downward further than he could see, and, driven by imminent necessity, he walked boldly down them. The way was rough with the decay of time from which stone itself cannot escape, but he always steadied himself with one hand against the wall. The stone was very cold, and Ned had the feeling that he was in a tomb. Once more he had that overwhelming sense of old, old things, of things as old as Egypt. At another time, despite every effort of reason, he would have thrilled with superstitious terror, but now it was for his life, and down he went, step by step. The air remained pure, like that of the great caves in the States, and Ned did not stop until a black void seemed to open almost before him when he drew back in a fright. Calming himself, he held up the lantern and looked at the void. It was a deep and square well, its walls faced as far as he could see with squared stones. His lantern revealed no water in the depths, and he fancied that it had something to do with ceremonial, perhaps with sacrifice. There was a way around the well, but it was narrow and he chose to go no further. Instead, he crouched on the steps where he was safe from a fall and put the lantern beside him. It was an oil lamp. Had he possessed any means of relighting it, he would have blown it out and sought sleep in the dark, but once out, out always, and he moved it into a little niche of the wall, where no sudden draft could get at it, and where its hidden light would be no beacon to any daring Mexican who might descend the stairway. The sense of vast antiquity was still with the boy, but it did not oppress him now as it might have done at another time. His feeling of relief, caused by his escape from the Mexicans, was so great that it created, for the time at least, a certain buoyancy of the mind. 
The unknown depths of the ancient pyramid were at once a shelter and a protection. He folded the serape in order to make as soft a couch as possible, and soon fell asleep. When Ned awoke, he was lying in exactly the same position on the steps, and the lantern was still burning in the niche. He had no idea how long he had slept, or whether it was the day or the night, but he did not care. He took the full canteen and drank. It was an unusually large canteen, and it contained enough, if he used an economy, to last him two days. The cool recesses of the pyramid's interior did not endanger thirst like its blazing summit. Then he ate, but whether breakfast, dinner, or supper, he did not know, nor did he care. He was tempted to go up to the entrance of the stairway and see what was going forward in the camp, but he resisted the impulse. For the sake of caution, he triumphed over curiosity and remained a long time on the steps, besides the niche on which his lamp sat. Then he began to calculate how much longer the oil would last, and he placed the time at about thirty hours. Surely some decisive event would happen in his favor before the last drop was burned. After an interminable time, the air on the stairway seemed to him to be growing colder, and he inferred that night had come. Taking the lantern, he climbed the steps and peered out at the ancient doorway. He saw lights below, and he could discern dimly the shapes of tents. Disappointed, he returned to his place on the steps, and, after another long wait, fell asleep again. When he awoke, he calculated by the amount of oil left in the lamp that at least twelve hours had passed since his previous awakening. Once more, he made a great effort of the will in order to achieve a conquest over curiosity and impatience. He would not return to the entrance until the oil had only an hour more to burn. Necessity had proved so stern a master that he was able to keep his resolution. Many long, long hours passed, and sometimes he dozed or slept, but he did not go to the entrance. The oil at last marked the final hour, and, taking up the lamp, he went back to the entrance. Ned looked out and then gave a cry of joy. It was broad daylight, but the army was gone. Soldiers, horses, tents, everything. The Cali de los Mortos was once more what its name meant. Silence and desolation had regained the ruined city. He blew out the lantern and set it down at the opening. It had served him well. Then he went out and climbed again to the summit of the pyramid, from which he examined the valley long and well. He saw no signs of human life anywhere. Traces of the camp remained in abundance, but the army itself had vanished. There were no lurking camp followers to make him trouble. He descended to the ground and stood a while, drawing in deep drafts of the fresh daylight air. It had not been oppressive in the pyramid, but there is nothing like the open sky above. He went down to the Tiwakan, and choosing a safe place bathed in its waters. Then he resumed the flight across the hills which had been delayed so long. He knew by the sun that it was morning, not far advanced, and he wished to travel many miles before night. He saw abundant evidences of the great highway that the army was marching toward Veracruz, and as before he traveled with a line parallel with it, but at least a mile away. He passed two sheep herders, but he displayed the machete, and whistling carelessly went on. They did not follow, and he was sure that they took him for a bandit whom it would be wise to let alone. Ned wandered on for two or three days. In one of his turnings among the mountains, he lost the Veracruz Highway and came out again upon a wide, sandy plain, dotted with scattered cactus. As he was crossing it, a norther came up and blew with great fierceness. Sand was driven into his face with such force that it stung like shot. The cold became intense, and if it had not been for the serape, he might have perished. The storm was still blowing when he reached the far edge of the plain and came to extremely rough country with patches of low, thorny forest. Here he found a dilapidated bark hut, evidently used at times by Mexican herdsmen, and thankful for such shelter, he crept into it and fell asleep. When he awoke, he felt very weak. He had eaten the last of his food seven or eight hours before. Driven by desperate need, Ned ate wild fruits and, for a while, was refreshed. But that night he fell ill, suffering greatly from internal pains. He was afraid at first that he had poisoned himself, and he knew that he had eaten something not used for food, but by morning the pains were gone, although he was much weaker than before. Now he felt for the first time the pangs of despair. It was a full two hundred miles yet to Veracruz, and he was in the heart of hostile country. He did not have the strength of a child left, and the chance that he could deliver his message of warning to the Texans seemed to have gone. He rambled about all that day, light-headed at times, and, toward evening, he fell into a stupor. Unable to go any further, he sank down beside a rock and lapsed wholly into unconsciousness. End of chapter 5. Reading by Mr. Duck.